Hello, everyone, and welcome to another Pod for Israel. And we are in our next installment of The Case for Messiah. And today we'll be looking at Genesis 3.15. And so, Golan, the question that we're going to be dealing with today is, is the New Testament wrong about Genesis 3.15? Does the New Testament refer to Genesis 15? Well, it Genesis does. Genesis 3.15? It does, it does. And so, obviously, we don't believe that the New Testament is wrong, right? But, but at the same time, we want to definitely address some of the arguments against the New Testament's interpretation. Yeah. And so... According to the New Testament, Genesis 3.15 is messianic. Now, it's worth saying that Genesis 3.15 is not mentioned a whole lot mm -hmm. in the New Testament. That's for sure. And it's not quoted word by word, right? No, n n no, it's not. But, but in Revelation chapter 12, uh, verses 1 through 3, verse 5, verse 9, you have this imagery of a woman about to give birth. She's crying out in labor pains. There's a dragon who's identified as the serpent of old who tries to kill the child and the child is born and he becomes the one that rules over the nations mm. and he crushes their heads with an iron scepter. And so there's an illusion. Yeah. So there's no question though that Genesis 3.15 here is being alluded to and the New Testament does see in Genesis 3.15 a messianic prophecy or an, uh, a passage that points to the Messiah. Okay, so so what, what are the main main objections against this messianic interpretation of, 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 of Genesis uh, 3.15? Well, actually, there are some really strong objections, and, and as we're going to see, they're pretty, they're pretty good objections, right? And so we want to take them very seriously, okay. and we want to deal with them. And so uh, we've come up with, as we've done our research, there are three primary objections. Yep. Uh, number one, Genesis 3.15 has nothing to do with the story of redemption, nothing to do with, with, the, Messiah. with the Messiah. It's only about people and snakes. Seed of the serpent seed is always a physical seed, and therefore we're dealing with mm. snakes. You know? Okay, so, so right? the claim is saying that f seed is only a physical seed, and that therefore there's physical snakes, physical people, yeah. that's it. So the battle is between the seed of the woman, people, and snakes, right? Okay. Baby snakes. Not baby sharks, right? There's a song there. <laughs> and the other objection, the second okay. objection? Genesis 3.15 has nothing to do with the virgin birth. You know, some claim that, you know, the wom women don't have seed, and so, sh you know, there's the seed of the woman, and therefore this has to be uh, the virgin birth. Mm. And okay. the last one? Okay, the last one um, is kind of what I would say is it's kind of an objection that's kind of an across-the-board objection to a lot of... G the messianic prophecies for being fulfilled in Jesus, and that is, if Genesis 3.15 is about the Messiah, I'll give that to you. Uh, Jesus obviously didn't fulfill it because, because. The, the devil is alive and well today. Yeah. He's still quite active, and therefore, he did not crush the head of the serpent. Okay, so let's, uh, let's start with claim number one, that Genesis talks only about people and snakes. Okay, so let's, let's look at it, and again... Uh, we want to, we talked about this last time, we really think it's important uh, to not, not to present straw men, not to, not to mischaracterize mm -hmm. what the opposition is saying and then, and then, and then tear them down. Yeah. We want to actually really uh, represent fairly what the opposition is yep. saying about the, the opposing views and then interact with it. So, the first, the first objection, right, that this is only about people and snakes, so you've got this Christian assumption, right? The Christian assumption of Genesis 3.15 is that there's a winner and there's a loser. Yeah. Genesis 3.15, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise you on the head and you shall bruise him on the heel. Yeah, and and so, this is God talking to the snake, right? Yeah, but... The serpent. And the so, serpent. So typically, the argument goes, in order to understand this as a messianic passage, you ask a Christian, who has the worst blow? Who has the, le <laughs> you know? And so, of course, hitting somebody on the head is much worse than striking somebody on the heel. And so, therefore, this is a prophecy that the Messiah would oh, defeat Satan. Satan, okay? Yeah. But Rashi's interpretation, nine words in Hebrew, Brilliant, honestly brilliant, so brilliant that John Calvin actually changed his position and he argued and he agreed with Rashi that this is about people and snakes. So what does Rashi say? What does he say? And thou shalt bruise his heel 
And you will have no height, i.e. the serpent. Mm-hmm. He'll be short or long, right? Mm-hmm. Not stand erect. You will be able to bite him only on the heel, but even at that spot, you will kill him. Now, let me kind of explain this because it's quite sophisticated. It's a brilliant response. And basically, what Rashi is saying is that you have the same word for striking on the head and the same word for striking yeah. on the heel. But if you want to you know, you, you grew up in a kibbutz. If you saw a snake, how would you have to kill it? With my leg, with my uh, heel. You'd, but you'd have to hit it on the head. On the head. Right? Yeah. That's the only way you can kill a snake. Is it? But if that same snake wants to kill you... He would have to bite me and... On the heel. Yep. But how does a, a snake can't hit you on the head? <laughs> right. <laughs> unless it's an anaconda from the Amazon, right? And so Genesis 49, 17 says this, Dan shall be a serpent in the way, a horned snake in the path that bites the horse's heel so that the rider falls backwards. And so exactly. what Rashi is saying yeah. is there's no winners here. They're, everybody's losers. So this can't be any kind of a promise of redemption. Mm-hmm. This is just about the conflict between people and snakes. Yeah, and it's, 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 it's about reality. This is the facts of life. There's an entity between, between man and snakes, and the, everybody can relate to it, right? Correct, it's, exactly. Yeah. Also, um, as we kind of explain the opposing position, they would also say that seed in the Hebrew Bible always refers to physical offspring, only and always mm. to physical offspring. So and therefore, seed is nothing spiritual. Nothing seed is, is always a physical seed. Correct. So if you, if you have the seed of the woman, you're dealing with physical offspring of the woman. If you have seed of the serpent, you're dealing yeah. with the physical offspring of the serpent. So people so, and snakes. People and snakes, that's it. There's no winners, there's no losers, and we're not dealing with any spiritual realities. We're just dealing with Physical realities. And by the way, you mentioned you know me growing up in the kibbutz. I think also this is what this is what we learned in school that this verse talks about the facts of life. Correct. People hate snakes. Snakes hate people. And Correct. That's it. Correct. So the seed of the serpent here are physical offspring of the serpent. Seed of the woman, physical offspring of yep. the woman. Um, so the bottom line is etiology, not, not eschatology. eschatology yeah. Remind me again, what is etiology? So etiology just explains it, it, it. It sees reality, and it and the Bible explains why are things so right? Okay. Why are things? Why are the reality looks like it? Like why there's the enmity between people and snakes? And this is the reason. So the story of the Garden of Eden is just simply to explain why number one, snakes mm, kill people. Exactly. People kill snakes. Why women have pain in childbirth? It's a yeah. natural phenomenon. Why men struggle against the elements, thorns, thistles, and why they die. That's it. There's nothing spiritual here. Exactly. Okay. Especially not eschatological. Correct. Yeah. So, and, and let's admit this, Golan, this, at first glance, this looks like a yep. great explanation of uh, the passage. And, and I grew up in Israel learning this. This is, this is right. basics. This is just okay. the, re- this is the reality. There's nothing more. So, let's, let's respond. Okay. okay. So, so, so what, what about that seed? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we've got a number of responses here, um, and again, we want to just challenge the viewers to to study for themselves, right? We want them to study for themselves. So the first response is that we acknowledge that seed is physical. However, it's also used metaphorically. So in the, the Bible uses the word seed, zera, in Hebrew, zera, uh-huh. also in a metaphorical way, and yes. we have a few examples. Yes. So we've got we've got three examples here. Um, so, for instance, in Malachi 2.15... And you're reading from which version? We're actually using the Chabad version. Which, which is, is an ultra-Orthodox? It's a, Yeah, well, it's an Orthodox translation, I'm assuming, but it's from their website. But notice how they translate Malachi 2.15. Now, did he not make one who had the rest of the spirits? Now, what does the one seek of the seed of God? Okay? Mm. They, the, the word here is zera Elohim. Yep. The seed of God. Now, the English trans, other English translations, some put it the seed, the fr- godly seed from seed, God, or but, godly, but yeah. literally, this is the seed of Zer God. Elohim. And and obviously, we wouldn't say that God has, of course not, a seed in yeah. that sense, right? Yeah. So it's a metaphorical, correct. And, say, and in Isaiah, Isaiah fifty-seven verse four, uh, on whom will you enjoy yourselves? Against whom do you open your mouth wide? Against whom do you stick out your tongue? Are you not Children of transgression, seed of falsehood. So, so Isaiah is calling Israel seed of falsehood, and of course, it, this is not a physical seed. Right. This is this is a spiritual meaning. This is a metaphorical meaning. And obviously, when we say that God's calling Israel children of transgression or seed of falsehood, we're not, we're talking about in this particular context, exactly. right? We're not. There's no intention here 
to accuse our people of anything. Of course, right? Of course not. But the point is, is that seed here is it's metaphorical. It's got to be. And right? the last example? The last one's an interesting example because it's from the verb to sow, but in Hebrew, in Hebrew it's zorea, zorea. So he who sows iniquity. And yeah. obviously you can't literally Lew. sow iniquity. It doesn't okay? have seeds, right? It, it doesn't, iniquity is not a seed. Yeah. Okay? So, so that's se- a matter of metaphorically. So seed is used metaphorically. So the second response. So the seed of the serpent. What about the yeah, seed so, of the serpent? So what we would argue in the context of Genesis 3.15 is that the seed of the serpent refers to spiritual enemies in the book of Genesis, not to physical snakes. And we can actually show it from the text. Correct. Exactly. In other words, here we're going to see that the best commentary in scripture is scripture. So okay? this is where it gets interesting. Correct. So what I find amazing is that Genesis 4 Uh, the very next chapter is, we could say, an exposition of the meaning of Genesis 3. Mm-hmm. And in that passage, we have this deadly struggle between two seed, between two offspring, Cain and Abel. Two brothers. Two brothers, mm-hmm. okay, from the same mother, but obviously their behavior is not the same. It's as if they're from different seeds. Yes. <laughs> And now, just for time's sake, we're not going to compare all these things. You know, there are a lot of parallels between the story of, of Cain and Abel and the story of Adam and Eve in the garden. Yep. But just a couple of things, what's really interesting is that after God confronts Abel, he says to, or sorry, when God confronts Cain, he mm-hmm. says, where is your brother Abel? Okay, what have you done? Which is interesting because that's exactly in chapter three what God says, where are you? He the says same to, use of to, language. To Adam, and then what have you done? Exactly. But, and here's what's really important. I want you to notice the way that God speaks to Cain now, he, he basically uses the exact same language that he used to refer to the serpent. Yep. So Genesis 4.11, now you are cursed From the ground. Aru, yeah. Aru min. Aru right? min. Aru right? from, yeah. And then exactly he says that in 3.14 of Genesis. Cursed are you yep. more. Okay? Again, in the context, Cain rose up, kills Abel. And then Cain is worried whoever finds me is going to kill me. And so here we have the, the language, at least in terms of themes, of a deadly struggle between seed of serpent, seed of woman. Exactly. Okay, again, the fact that Cain goes out east of Eden, uh, God drives Adam and Eve out east of Eden. So what we're arguing here is that the language that God uses of the serpent and applies it to Cain suggests that the serpent is Cain's spiritual, exactly. metaphorical father. And it shows that the serpent is not just another snake. Correct. There's something else with this serpent. And the, the, the relationship between the serpent and Cain is different. It's spiritual. So, Cain, the, again, Genesis 4 is an exposition of Genesis 3. Now, Golan, you are our, <laughs> you are our go-to for the sages. What did the Jewish sages, uh, did, what did they say about so, Cain? So, we see that even the sages see that there's something more Not only with Cain as a, as a, as a result of, of sin and, and something, something really evil, but, but the serpent himself, it's not just a regular serpent. And I, if, if you can read uh, from the uh, Babylon Talmud, tractate Sota 9b, and we'll, we're going to build a case. But okay, so let's look at this. So it says, and so too we found with regard to the primeval snake who seduced Eve, for he placed his eyes on that which was unfit for him, and he wanted to... To marry, marry Eve. Eve. Because, so he saw Adam and Eve naked and he wanted Eve. So, we're, so, so from the beginning, we see that the sages realize it's not a regular snake because usually snakes are not attracted <laughs> to women, right? <laughs> I don't think so. Exactly. Okay. Okay. So Shabbat, Shabbat 146a, 146a, the snake came upon Eve. So wait, so the snake came and came in a sexual way, of course. Uh, so that's what the Hebrew says yep. here. That's what it means, okay? When it seduced her to eat from the tree of the knowledge, it infected her with moral contamination. And this contamination remained in all human beings. When the Jewish people stood at Mount Sinai, their contamination ceased, whereas Gentiles did not stand at Mount Sinai and their contamination so, never so, ceased. So in this sense, the Jewish people are descendants of Seth and the Gentiles are descendants of Cain. 
Ah, you see? Interesting. interesting. But it goes on, and this is the... I think this is the clearest one in Pirkei de Rabbi Eliezer, yeah. okay? So notice Sama, Samael. Who's Which Samael? Is, Samael is another name for Satan. Okay, Samael riding on the serpent came to her. To Eve. Came to her. Yeah. And she conceived... Cain. Cain. So she conceived, according to this rabbinic midrash, Eve conceived Cain from Satan. Interesting, interesting. Yeah. So in other words, what we're saying is that according to the context, Cain is presented as the metaphorical seed of the serpent. Exactly. Right? And the that the yeah, we don't think the rabbis actually thinks that Eve no. slept with the serpent, but spiritually speaking, Correct. that's what they're saying. Correct. Okay. Now let's keep going. And we'll notice that the same kinds of things are also going on with Canaan. Because it goes on. It's, it, it's, not, it's, it's not bound to Cain and Abel. The, 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 the story continues. Exactly. The with lines the, continue. With, 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 with a fight between two seeds, two spiritual seeds. So Cain, and who's Cain's spiritual daddy? And so, I, again, just for time's sake, it is really interesting that if you kind of start to compare the story of Noah with the story of Adam and Eve, Noah gets this renewed creation mm. mandate, just like Adam. But what's interesting is that in Genesis 9.20, Noah plants a, a vineyard just like God had planted yep. a, a garden. He drinks and takes of the fruit of the vine. Adam and Eve take of the fruit of the in, tree. Yeah. And in Hebrew, it's obvious that the language is the same language. Correct. Yeah. Noah uncovers himself. Adam and Eve are naked, yep. right? Shem and Japheth cover up the nakedness of of their father, God covers up the nakedness of Adam. And so it's clear that these are parallel it's texts. Like no way is the new Adam, is the new creation. So the moment we start to see this, suddenly we realize that just like Genesis 4 is an interpretation of Genesis 3, we start to realize that the story of Adam or the story of Noah actually gives us insight into the meaning mm. of Genesis 3.15. And sure enough, yep. I want you to notice this. Genesis 9, 25 through 27. So he said... Right to Canaan, cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants. And this is Noah speaking, right? This is Noah. Yep. And then it says, and let Canaan be his servant, and let Canaan be his servant. Well, that is absolutely a clear reference yep. back to what God says to the serpent when he says, cursed are you, and then he puts him in the place of total humiliation. On your belly you will go, and dust you will eat all the days of your life. There will be enmity between your seed and her seed. And so Canaan is presented as the offspring, as the, the spiritual offspring. offspring of the serpent. And yeah. so obviously Genesis 3.15 is not just dealing with people and snakes, but the yeah. redemptive story. Yep, exactly. Re response three. So yep. not only, not only... Does the serpent have a metaphorical seed, okay? But we also see that the seed of the woman refers, in the context of Genesis, not to every human being. This is like a promised seed. But a promised seed, a chosen line. And, okay. and we have several passages that confirm this. So, for instance, I think, again, Genesis 4, if we look at what it says in Genesis mm -hmm. 4.25... Adam had relations with his, and I, we translated here woman because in Hebrew, wife and woman are the same. Yeah. Woman again, and she gave birth to a son and named him Shet, mm -hmm. Seth, for she said, God has shotly, God has placed for me another seed. Well, guess what? There are three words here, right? Isha, woman, mm -hmm. seed, and to put or to place. Yeah, a that, sheet or Shet, yeah that only appear one other time in the entire Hebrew wow. Bible, Genesis 3.15. So it's clear, identical language. So God says, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her, her seed. So Eve is actually interpreting Genesis 3.15 here, not as every human being, but as a specific seed, a, a specific special line, line, a special line, a chosen line. Mm. By the way, the same thing happens in, in Genesis 5.29 when we're dealing with the sons of Seth or the sons of Adam on the chosen side of the line. We yeah. come to Noah, and it's interesting how his father names Noah. Now he called his name Noah, saying, This one will give us rest from our pain 
from our work and from the pain of our hands arising from the ground, yep. which the Lord has cursed. And pain is etzev, yeah, it's a bone. It's a bone. And so here we Grieve. have an absolute reference back to Genesis 3, but what's remarkable is that we have the hope of someone within the chosen line, line yep. who will bring relief from the curse. And so the seed of the woman here cannot be every human being. We're dealing with the story of redemption through a chosen line. And it goes, and, and there's two seeds fighting among themselves, with two lines. A deadly struggle. And yeah. so we even, once again, let's go back now to Noah's words when he wakes up from his stupor, right? And he realizes what happens. Yep. Okay. He says, cursed be Cain, a servant of servants, yep. right? To parallel to a parallel to the serpent and mm -hmm. to the seed of the serpent. But then he says, blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem. Shem. And so here we see that the Shem is associated just like Seth, just like Noah with the seed of the woman. So once again, we see that the, the whole tr attempt to say this is just about people and snakes, it doesn't fit the larger and context. And it seems that the, 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 the seed is like a, a really central motif all over Genesis. The word seed, uh, I forget how many times I counted <laughs> before this podcast, but we've actually listed all these references. Seed is crucial. Like the, the word seed is not just, it's, it's a major motif in Genesis. And it's placed in, 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 in strategic, uh, strategic places, right? In Promises to the seed. And you've got, what's interesting is you've got, Genesis is divided up into 10, what's called toldot, toldot structures, yeah. like the generation structures. And the whole purpose is to identify chosen and not so chosen or yep. unchosen Again, seed. the two lines, the two seeds, yeah. And another major theme in Genesis is enmity between two bloodlines, mm. right? Different bloodlines where you've got the, the cursed, blessing coming yeah. through a particular bloodline. So Genesis 3.15, just about people and snakes, it doesn't fit the story. It's almost like an exposition to the whole story of Genesis. It's the teaser, it's the opening, yep. just like a great movie, right? You've got the, the beginning, the introduction to the movie, sets your expectations for the rest of the movie. So the fourth response is that the seed in Genesis is not only a chosen line, but also a promised king. Okay, it's really important to see that yes, there's a chosen line. And in seed, there's an, actually a collective aspect to seed because seed can mean children, descendants, but seed can also mean a single descendant. And what's interesting is if you trace the theme of Genesis, you'll realize that ultimately out of the chosen line will come a chosen king. A king. Again, for time's sake, we're not gonna have time to deal with all of the passages, but I just want you to notice the phrase, the last days. Acharit hayamim in Hebrew. Acharit yamim, yeah. It actually appears four times, four times in the Torah, but I wanna call attention to three of them. In three places in the Torah, you have a focus on an individual who is blessing the tribes of Israel. Jacob, Balaam, who tries to curse but blesses them, and Moses, right at the end of the Torah. By the way, there's a rabbinic commentator that says that every time in the Torah that Acharit Ayimim appears, it's a messianic ah, Kimchi. prophecy. Yep. Kimchi actually says every time the phrase is, appears, it's about the Messiah, also in the prophets. Mm -hmm. Okay, But notice that Jacob says in Genesis 49, 1, you know, I will tell you what will happen to you in the last days. Acharit Ayimim. Balaam says in Numbers 24, 14, I will tell you what this people do to your people in the last Not days. days. Deuteronomy 21, verse 29, evil will befall you in the last days. And so eschatology is central to these poems about blessing in the Torah. And what's interesting is that in the context of Jacob talking about the last days, mm -hmm. he suddenly talks about Judah and that your hand will be on the neck of your enemies. You've taken control of his head, the enemies, and the scepter will, will not depart from Judah and he will rule over the nations. Again, what's interesting, if you look then at, um, if you look at uh, Balaam's prophecy and you've got in the last days, this star, he sees a star who will come forth, a, a, a scepter out of Jacob, and he will crush through the foreheads of Moab. There's a okay? language. A language uh, Deuteronomy yeah. 33 and verse five and then verse seven, a reference to a king. Our point here, Golan, is that if we take seriously Genesis 3.15 in the context, not just of Genesis, but in the context of the whole Torah, it is clear that this chosen line will bring forth a chosen king. And so ultimately, yep. this king is the one who will crush the heads 
of the enemy. So we're talking about a special seed, this not is, every human being. Yeah. This is messianic. Yep. And response number five, <laughs> uh, even other books in the Hebrew Bible, in the Tanakh, interpret Genesis 3.15 right. uh, in an eschatological way. So we say, Im kol kavod la Rashi, with all with due all respect, respect to Rashi, right? If I have to choose between an interpretation of, of a later rabbi or the interpretation that the Hebrew Bible gives of passages. It's always better to go with the earliest. Always better. It's always best. It is the <laughs> right thing to do. Yeah. And what we see, just a couple of because examples. Because of the common language, right? Yes. So a couple of things. So again, in Genesis 3.15, you've got this reference to enmity and seed and striking on the head. Yep. What's interesting is the word enmity, the root, appears elsewhere only two other times in Genesis. And in both cases, there's a promise of a seed who will possess the gate of his enemies. Yeah, and in right? Hebrew, you see it's, it's, it's almost similar. It's so clear, but yeah. th so in Genesis 22, verse 17, you've got this seed, you know, possessing the gate of an enemies. And then you have in Numbers 24, 17 through 18, which is a messianic passage, you actually have a... Midrash or an interpretation of Genesis twenty two seventeen that's messianic. Yep. He talks about this king that's going to crush through the forehead of Moab, but and notice it says, and tear down all the sons of Sheth. Edom shall take shall be a possession, right? Seir, its enemies yes, seir also will be a possession. Yep. Now the word here, Seir, its enemies. In Hebrew, it looks. Exactly the same, as exactly. the gates of his enemies. Exactly. And the phrase here is so unique that what we see is a messianic interpretation, not just of God's promise to Abraham, but a, a messianic interpretation of Genesis 3.15. An early Midrash. Huh? Correct. You've got a messianic interpretation of Genesis 3.14 and 15 in the book in of Isaiah. Isaiah. Mm. And so, again, this whole reference to a serpent eating dust, okay, in, at the end of Isaiah, Isaiah 65, verse 23, you've got reference to a, a blessed seed, but mm -hmm. notice what it says in verse 25. Yep. The wolf and the lamb will graze together and the lion will eat straw like an ox and dust will be the serpent's food. Now, even, even the, the ancient rabbis, the, the, and ancient interpreters, Jewish interpreters, they see this as a reference to, to Genesis 3.14. In other words, Isaiah is reading the story of Genesis 3, 14 and 15. He's prophesying it's through the just, lens of Genesis. It's not just about people and snakes. It's about God's messianic program. Yep. And uh, the battle between the seeds go on, between the two spiritual correct, seeds. Correct. Again, in Psalm 72, verses 8 and 9, and then verse 17, again, you've got this king that's going to rule from, from sea to sea to the ends of the earth, and his enemies will what? lick the dust. Exactly, okay? like the snake, like the And serpent. again, this the reference to the fact that this king in Psalm 72 is going to rule from sea to sea to the ends of the earth, because that's the exact same language we find in Zechariah 9, 9 and 10 about the Messiah. Mm -hmm. Our point being that Genesis 3.15 is being interpreted as eschatology by the prophets and ultimately fulfilled in the Messiah. And also in Psalm 110, right? Ah, so here's another interesting another, one. With Hebrew again, the play so, words. Uh, so the word, uh, eva ashit, I will put enmity. It's a, it's, a, it's a cluster of words or it's a, it's a word pair that's only found one other time in the entire Hebrew Bible. <sighs> Guess where it's found? It's found in Psalm 110, verse one, where God says, you know, what, a Psalm of David, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies <laughs> a footstool for your feet. The word, I will make your enemies, is a, it's it's the only time elsewhere in the entire Hebrew Bible where you have that the two phrase. pairs of words put together. And then in verse six, it says that this king will shatter the head, wow. crush the head. And so once again... Genesis David is doing a midrash. <laughs> David is reading David is reading Genesis 3:15 just like the New Testament, but okay. long before the New Testament. So, so what about response 6? Other Jewish sources beside the Hebrew Bible in the New Testament that interpret uh, Genesis 3:15? So my dear hatted friend, the beautiful hat. You're going to tell us, right? What had, what did you find in terms of rabbinic exegesis? Okay, of, so the first example Genesis. is what we call Tergum Yerushalmi or Neophyti to Aramaic. And there it specifically 
just interpreting, just uh, translating Genesis 3.15 into Aramaic, specifically says, in the day of the King Messiah. Just a, a, just a little correction. So uh, the Jerusalem uh, the Jerusalem Aramaic Targum and the Ephibi, they're actually two different Targums, but they're very similar. Exactly. They're, they're very, very really similar. similar. And both of these Targums, which are quite ancient, interpret this passage messianically. And by the way, also in Targum Yonatan, it says, it, it ends with the King Messiah, exactly okay. like the Neophyte. So the New Testament is not being Not unique, alone. Right? <laughs> <laughs> okay, what about Toldot Yitzchak? Yes, yeah, so Toldot Yitzchak, it's uh, maybe a later, a later commentary, but still a rabbinic commentary, a valid one. And what does it say there? Okay, we should read this. And he said, all the days of your life, Genesis 3, 14, to include the time of the Messiah. Mm -hmm. And even then, when the enmity between the serpent and the seed of the woman has been removed, as it is written, the nursing child will play by the hole of the cobra, Isaiah 11. Yep. The food of dust will never depart from him, as it is written, and dust will be the serpent's food. Here it is, Isaiah 65. And thus the sages said at the departure from Egypt, the days of your life, this world, all the days of your life to bring in the days of the Messiah. And so we're not saying anything by saying that Genesis 3.15 is messianic. We're, we're not... This by, is nothing new under the sun, right? And the New Testament is, is written by Jewish people who are reading the Bible in a very Jewish manner. And so they're like not- Like other Jewish people. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. Exactly. Okay, so let's go to claim number two that uh, Genesis 3.15 has nothing to do with the virgin birth. Okay, so let's look at what the argument. Well, let's look at the argument. So there, the common Christian assumption uh, is? Says, says those who had, a, you know, try to refute the messianic or the Christian interpretation. Yeah, women do not have sp uh, seed or sperm. So, and that why? That's so why? If, uh, the fact that there's the seed of the woman, women don't have seed, yeah. therefore this has to be, you know, this has to be a virgin, right? And, and so that's kind of the Christian assumption, yeah. okay? But, but... Those who reject this assumption are saying what? Well, that seed doesn't here refer to sperm, it refers to offspring, whether singular or collective. Yeah, and not only that, there's other passages. There are three other passages that, in the Torah that refer to the seed of women. Specifically speak about the, the seed, seed of, of women. So Eve wasn't the only one. Right, and so and so, uh, this is the, the way to, say, refute uh, the interpretation that says that this is about the virgin birth. So and, what is our response? Well, here's our response, Golan. First of all, we agree. We right? agree, right? I mean, I think that, I think to say that this passage is referring to the virgin birth is not a reflection on the New Testament's yeah. handling of the text. Yeah. I think it's just it's a reflection of bad Christian interpretation. So in other of the words, passage. the New Testament doesn't use Genesis three fifteen to prove the virgin birth, no, right? The no. New Testament never makes that claim. Yeah. And interesting, let's just kind of look at it. So you know. Uh, Eve actually says that God gives her a seed in place of Abel. In 425, so, so right? So she has a seed, yep. a child, a son. Hagar, she has a seed. I will make your I will greatly multiply your seed. seed. Rebecca has a also. seed, and may your seed possess the gate of those who ate him. And so here I, I would I would argue that the refutation is not a refutation against the New Testament's interpretation yeah, like and not mis, our interpretation. Misinterpretation. It's then. just a refutation of an interpretation exactly. that needs to be refuted exactly. because we disagree with that interpretation too. Exactly. Okay, but there is and a this, but. And this is interesting. This, yeah. th there is a but, okay? there. I think more does need to be said about Genesis 3 and particularly the role of the woman in verse 16, verses 15 and 16, mm -hmm. okay? And we talked about this that, you know, You've got this reference to the woman and the struggle of the woman and the seed of the woman. Here's what's really interesting is that we see that women are part of the story of redemption, yeah. right, in Genesis. And this promised seed is going to come with etziv, with suffering. With suffering, but not only suffering, but supernatural so God would have God would inter intervene. There are all sorts of obstacles that God overcomes, all sorts of supernatural things he does so that the matriarchs can become pregnant, okay? So for instance, so we have a few examples, yeah. <laughs> Sarai, Rebecca, Rachel, all of them were barren. Okay, Genesis 11.30, Genesis 25.21, Genesis 29.31. Yeah, and there's a Hebrew scholar who says that even Leah was Be barren because it says God opened her womb. So a even an Israeli scholar. So every single pregnancy in the story of God bringing forth the chosen line is miraculous. Even Ruth, which is the 
grandma or grand grandma of the Messiah of, of David. So how how was that miraculous? Because in Ruth it says he opened her womb after she was married for ten years to Machlon. Ruth ah. was married to ten, for ten years, never had kids. She marries Boaz. Boom, there's That's a kid. That's an amazing yeah. point. That's why this Israeli scholar said that it's not only Sarah, Rebecca, and Rachel. It's Leah and Ruth and other other key women in the Bible. So we would expect in the story of redemption to be consistent with what God does in Genesis, miraculous exactly. pregnancies, right? Exactly. So the promised seed would come with a miraculous pregnancy. And so while we would agree that Genesis 3.15 does not refer to the virgin birth, we think that that's just an incorrect handling of the passage. The fact of the matter is, is the reference to the woman in Genesis 3 and the ways in which God uses the chosen matriarchs exactly. and the way that they become pregnant, uh, it would not be inconsistent or in fact, it would be quite expected that the Messiah the Messiah's mother would also yeah. experience a supernatural it pregnancy. It gives us a, an, an expectation for the Messiah's birth. Yes, It would also exactly. be a supernatural. It's not a surprise. Exactly. Okay. So the last claim. Yes. Okay, so you convinced me. Genesis 3.15 is talking about the Messiah. <laughs> But the devil is still around. What's going on with that? Tell me what, about wasn't it. Wasn't yeah. the Messiah supposed to crush his head? Yeah, tell me about it. Yeah, the devil is still very active, right? And so one of the arguments, the opposing arguments is that, you know, even in the New Testament, Satan is alive and well. And so- Yeah, the New Testament affirms, affirms yeah, that. You know, in Acts chapter 5, verse 3, I want to look at um, actually 1 Peter 5, 8. Be of sober spirit, be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, lion seeking someone to devour. So the New Testament doesn't deny that the devil is still around. Yes. Kicking. Okay, but the 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 the, the 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 refutation or the opposition would say so. This is proof that Jesus didn't fulfill Genesis three fifteen. So mm. even if it's about the Messiah, it can't be about Jesus. Yep. Okay. So our response it would be again. Let's let's get things clear, okay? Um, the New Testament never claims that the devil's head was crushed at the cross. At the first coming of Yeshua. Yeah. Correct. In other words, it never makes that claim. Now, again, I've heard Christians make that claim. I've heard, I've heard Christians make that claim that the devil was completely defeated and it was done, but the New Testament doesn't make that claim. Right. Genesis 3.15, and the point of Genesis 3.15 is that there would be a de deadly struggle between the serpent seed and the woman's mm -hmm. seed. Genesis makes clear that in spite of the struggle, the seed of the woman would one day be victorious. Exactly. Okay, Genesis twenty two seventeen. your seed shall possess the gate of his enemies. It says of Judah in Genesis 49, verse 8, Judah, your brother shall praise you. Your hand shall be on the neck of your enemies. Again, taking control of the head of the enemies. Isaiah affirms that when the Messiah reigns, the serpent will eat dust. So in the end of days, yes. it would happen. So according to the New Testament, the devil's judgment or the final judgment of the devil is in the future. Now, was there some kind of a defeat or of, of a humiliation of the devil on the cross? Of, of course. course there was. We don't deny that either. And the New Testament talks about that. But the New Testament never claims that the devil is completely crushed and defeated what, at the at the first coming of Jesus, rather, and and we're going back to Revelation. We started with Revelation, and we're ending Revelation with it. twenty yeah. verses seven through ten. Mm -hmm. Notice what the New Testament says: When the thousand years are completed, Satan will be released from his prison and will come out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together for the war. The number of them is like the sand of the seashore, and they came up on the broad plain of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints in the beloved city. And fire came down from heaven and devoured them. And the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and, all, and the false prophet all, are also, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. In other words, when Yeshua has returned, when he returns the yes. second time, yes. then the devil would be defeated. So let's make things really clear because I guess what typically happens is the opposition uses the fact that Jesus, the kingdom wasn't set up uh, the fact that, for instance, the devil is still alive and well as sort of proof that Jesus isn't the Messiah. No, this is just basically showing that the rabbinic Jewish expectation of the Messiah 
is at odds with the New Testament exactly. understanding of the of the of what the Messiah is supposed to do, and that's yeah. you can't use that as an argument against. In other words, you have to prove that in the Hebrew Bible there is no reference to the rejection of the Messiah, to the suffering of exactly. the Messiah, and so. The bottom line is this objection doesn't hold any weight. All it simply does is it reinforces what what the rabbis believe to be the correct picture about the Messiah, but here's where we would differ, and yep. we would argue that the New Testament reading of Genesis 3.15, the New Testament interpretation of Genesis 3.15 is very solid, very substantial, and therefore there are very good reasons to believe Amen. that Jesus is the promised Messiah. So let's do a short summary and yes. just sum up the three three uh, arguments that we, uh, that we made. So summarize. Yep. Although some claim that Genesis 3.15 is just about people and snakes, if we look at the verse in the immediate and larger context... A close reading of the text, a right? A close reading of the text, it's clear it refers to God's promise to bring blessing through a chosen and seed. And we see it all through Genesis, yes. let alone the, the, the entire Bible, of course. Yeah. Correct. Although Genesis 3.15 does not refer to the virgin birth, the story of Genesis tells us uh, it, it helps us to expect miraculous pregnancies of our matriarchs yep. as God fulfills Genesis 3.15. So the promise does come with a pain and with an intervention of, of the Lord. Somehow God overcomes exactly. something, a barrier. And then third and finally, yes, the devil is still active, but that doesn't refute the New Testament's interpretation of On the this contrary, passage. the New Testament says. Exactly. On the contrary, it just reinforces it that the New Testament tells us that his defeat is sometime in the future. And so once again, we, we turn to you, our viewers, and we want to encourage you to study these passages, to seek and to see if, in fact, the New Testament has accurately understood the Hebrew Bible and its promise of the coming Messiah and that Jesus is that promised Messiah. Amen. Golan, Amen. enjoyed speaking to you yet again. Thanks, old buddy. If this touched your heart, will you help pay it forward to reach others who need to hear this message? Partner with our team to bring the gospel to Israel and the nations.